Join me and Tom Hinkling with our session about Windows Virtual Desktop. Hey everybody and welcome to today's session. We're going to be talking about Windows Virtual Desktop and joining me is Tom. Tom, welcome to the session. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So could you introduce yourself to the audience and tell them a bit about what today's session is going to be about, please? Yeah, will do. So my name's Tom Hickling. I'm uh, what's referred to at Microsoft as a Windows Virtual Desktop Global Black Belt. Now, that's a bit of a silly name, but it's really there just to know a specialization rather than any martial arts. Um, I cover EMEA um, as part of a small team, but we are part of, as the name suggests, a global team that covers America and Asia Pac as well. So um, this session is really just to go into a bit more detail around WVD, in particular, the roadmap. So WVD has been released over a year now. There's been a whole host of new capabilities and services and uh, new features that have been dropped into the platform. Um, there is also a long, long list of backlog items, some of which have made it onto our roadmap, which is publicly available. And I'm just going to talk about four of those particular roadmap items in this session. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, first of all, I just want to talk about how Windows Virtual Desktop or WVD has actually been a technology that's kind of soared, I think is maybe fair to say, during the pandemic. Um, how has it actually helped organisations with the pandemic and the working at home situation that we've all found ourselves in? Yeah, so, um, so WVD was getting traction before COVID hit. Mm. Um, and that's because End user computing is a generic type of workload that lots of organizations have inside of their environment. And it's come it always comes up for renewal at some point in their in their sort of life cycle. So all of these organizations at some point we're going to look at WVD, you know, not necessarily adopt it, but just look at it as a as a service. Obviously, then COVID hit and that massively changed things almost overnight. Um, Obviously, the reason for that is all of these, well, we know all of us, in fact, you know, millions of people have now had to work from home and it's been forced on us. Now, um, what we typically see is lots of organizations who have got virtual desktop inside their own estate um, use it for a number of use cases. And it's predominantly the use case of having your data secured back in the data center, no data on devices that can't be lost. So you've got, you're consolidating all of your um, end user compute inside of your data center. However, from the from the get go, remote access has always been one of the top, you know, three, four use cases uh, in terms of, I suppose, selling the value of virtual desktop. However, what we've seen is the vast majority of organizations haven't used it in that use case. Now, they have used it in, in some small context. So it might be execs, it might be those people who are, whose job genuinely is being remote and traveling and visiting customers. Um, and the other use case is IT, so IT remote support. Um, besides that, look, there haven't been very many organizations, if any, that have adopted it, firstly, because of this remote access um, capability. Then obviously COVID hits, people are forced to work from home. Um, lots of customers might have a small capability in this space or they might have some sort of vpn solution um but they can't necessarily um you know scale it up so that tomorrow or in, you know even within a week sort of time they can have all of their users working successfully from home and that's typically because these legacy or you know existing virtual desktop solutions require you know if they're going to scale out they need to buy new hardware that's procurement time racking and stacking that takes a lot of time possibly new licenses. And the same could be said for a VPN. So a VPN is constricted by the device or the devices that, uh, that an organization has. And that, and like I said, the, the user demand for that is typically very sort of static. Now there's this massive demand. They might be able to accommodate a few new users, but they would probably have to scale up or, or purchase new appliances. Again, potentially new um, licenses to support that. So um, the, the key, I suppose, feature of WVD has been that it's based upon Azure. Azure is a hyperscale cloud platform. You can go and deploy in minutes uh, rather than weeks, months, um, and you're not paying for anything until you've actually gone and deployed it. So there's no requirement for customers to go and buy hardware and then wait for it to be delivered. They can just go to the portal and deploy 
and it will deploy there and then, and they only start paying once the infrastructure is there. So um, it's been a, a lifesaver for lots of organizations. We had one um, CIO who, who during the pandemic, we, we were on a call and then he just said, can we actually do this? Like genuinely, can we do this? The answer obviously was yes. And then we heard, you know, within two or three weeks, they'd actually gone and deployed this and got 4,000 users on the platform being productive. His his final words were, um, WVD saved our bacon. So, you know, that's the kind of thing that you <laughs> want to hear in terms of your product saving people's businesses. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that sounds really good, actually. How does it work, though, if an organisation maybe isn't fully bought into the cloud yet, they haven't moved all their workloads, they're maybe running in a hybrid infrastructure, a lot of their back-end kind of applications run on-prem, and then WVDs up in the cloud, is that a scenario we're seeing customers enable? Is there any complexity to that? What's your view on that, Tom? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing is WVD is Azure only. So we only support the virtual machines, i.e. the virtual desktops that users connect to running in Azure. We don't support any on-premises uh, virtual desktops. So users have to connect into Azure in order to get onto the desktop where they can then go and consume their apps and data. Um, pretty much every single organization out there has their apps and data back on premises. So we need some kind of connectivity to get the user from their virtual desktop back to where their apps and data reside. So um, for enterprises, we have a product express route, private dedicated connection back to on premises, or you could be using a site to site VPN. Obviously, there's some time differences and um, in terms of configuring that. So a VPN, you know, could take half an hour to set up. Express route might take weeks, if not longer, and it's obviously more expensive, but it is a private and dedicated connection for that customer up into Azure and vice versa. <clears throat> so um, to enable that connectivity, there is that requirement to have that physical connectivity in the first instance. Um, and that's, you know, that's, you know, millions of customers out there are using Express route. So whilst it's not a, a, a you know, a two second job, it, it can be done and it can be done relatively quickly. The mm -hmm. next problem um, typically comes from IT security. So what they don't like is to have um, network connections between two locations just open to everything. Now, the problem with end user computing is you might have thousands of applications, you know, the client side of those applications running on these virtual desktops for a, for a large organization. And those apps might all have their own port requirements that need to be opened in order to talk to uh, you know a whole gamut of different back ends and um, some customers have tried to open up individual file rules for these in individual applications it's a nightmare because they don't necessarily know them up front because they might not have documented it because they might not have ever needed to do this before um, so they would have to then start troubleshooting why things aren't working and understand the ports and then go through um, you know the, the firewall change request process to get these ports opened and then do it for the next app and if there's thousands of them it's a nightmare so what we typically see customers having is effectively an any any rule and that's the last thing that IT security wants to hear because they think that that's drastically insecure in reality we're connecting Azure which is secure to a customer's location which we would hope is secure um, if they've got IT security saying that this is a problem that kind of suggests that they've got some kind of security context in place so um, besides that really there's not that many sort of particular hybrid um, issues um, which is I suppose a good thing Okay, that, that's good to know that customers can maybe pick and choose their cloud um, workloads to to prioritize depending on their needs and then kind of build up as they as they go forward. Um, yep. So the roadmap, you mentioned you're going to be yep. sharing some um, information around that. Could we, could we have a look at that now, Tom, please? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let me just bring up these slides. Um, hopefully that's come through. So um, we're going to look at four areas uh, or four capabilities that's on our roadmap. The first is a thing called MSIX App Attach. Um, then we're going to talk about RDP Short Path Private, which does have a hybrid um, uh, connotation. So my, interesting bringing it back to that hybrid conversation. Um, screen scraping protection and then start VM on connect, which itself is actually in private preview at this point. So this is a, a bit of a sneak peek at that capability. So let's start off with MSIX AppAttach. 
So uh, this slide um, of the pancakes is there really just to denote this layering capability. Um, there are lots of layers involved in virtual desktop. And what this is doing is the ability to separate those layers out. Um, and we really call it the future of application delivery because that's our view at this point in terms of how we get these applications to the virtual machines that users are consuming in a much more dynamic and efficient manner. To take a step back to show the context here, on a physical device, um, a user's profile, you know, their persona that makes them them on their um, machine is intrinsically linked to the OS, as is all of the applications on that virtual machine, such that if a user gets a new laptop tomorrow, they can't expect everything to be there as they left their previous laptop. So that's the, the kind of the problem that we're trying to resolve. And we call that breaking the, mo the monolith effectively. Now, in, in WVD, our goal is to try to completely and utterly separate all of these, these layers, i.e. breaking the mo monolith. And we've actually done half of that with the user profile already. So we acquired a company called FS Logics and they have a capability that manages user profiles and they store the profiles on some storage and then bring that profile into any VM that the user signs into on any given day. So that kind of gets us half of the way there. The next side is the applications. What can we do around the applications? Now, this is particularly relevant when customers are doing virtual desktop in a pooled environment, i.e. you have a collection of users that need different sets of applications, and they're signing into any one of any VM in this pool on any given day. Now, like I said, we can bring the profile in to make their user experience the same every single day, but what can we do around delivering the applications dynamically to a VM that they haven't been logged on to before when they need it? And that's really where MSIX AppAttach comes in. And um, I've just listed it down there together, because MSIX AppAttach is the combination of two separate things, MSIX and AppAttach. So MSIX on its own predates WVD, and it's our new packaging format. And it will effectively replace everything that goes before it. So MSIs, XEs, things like AppV. Um, it won't necessarily bring every single capability from all of those, but it will be the the packaging format of choice going forward. And there are lots of developers out there who are already developing their applications natively in MSIX format. And we do have a conversion tool out there to, to help customers move from previous formats over into MSIX. And then AppAttach. And AppAttach is a WVD specific component for, as the name suggests, the attaching of these MSIX apps to the WVD session hosts. So this, this part is only relevant in a WVD context. So just for, again, a little bit of context, this is the, the process that it um, of, of AppAttach in comparison to FS Logics. So we, we've got lots of customers that have done FS Logics in WVD. So just to show how this operates in comparison. So a user will sign into WVD as they do today. They'll get their resource feed. They'll get some icons they can launch that represent the, the apps and desktop that they can um, they can connect to. Their connection is brokered by the control plane and they are connected to a particular session host, at which point FS Logix kicks in and loads the user's profile into that session. Hence now the user's, um, their persona is now back onto that session host, effectively where they left off the, the previous day. So that's good. <clears throat> What WVD will then also do is read the MSIX apps that the user has been assigned, and then in like manner, um, mount the VHDs from storage that contains the applications that they can consume. Now, the, the one thing that's worth pointing out here is that AppAttach is not using the FS Logix technology to do this. It's just doing effectively exactly the same thing that FS Logix does for the profile, but we're now doing it for applications. And the support is built into Windows 10, 2004 and above. So no need for any agents or any management infrastructure. It's built into the OS. All that we need is an SMB file share. Now, once we've got this, what it effectively enables organizations to do is to shift from a traditional type of management and application delivery to this sort of new modern 
mechanism. So on the left hand side here, this kind of describes the traditional experience that we find most of our customers have kind of fallen into in some respects. And this just very, <clears throat> this oversimplifies it, but it kind of demonstrates the point. In this instance, I've just got three images for three business units. Now, most organizations will have more than this, and they might have them for different collections of users. It might be projects, it might be applications, it might be geography, whatever it is, they tend to have different images for these different sets of users. And then there are a set of common apps across all of them, and then some departmental apps. Now, if the image for sales, for example, needs to be updated, then there's a process to go and update the image and then roll that out to everywhere that the sales uh, VMs are deployed. That There's a bit of work there. What that also means is that if they started off, if all of these images started off from the same image, they've now separated from each other. And as is the case, customers are managing different images separately. So they will sort of diverge over time. Again, if a common app needs to be updated, then it needs to be updated and rolled out across all images and all VMs that it's present within. In, in this case, across all three, so that's everything in my in my case. And then if a departmental app needs to be updated, so for example, one of the HR apps, that needs to be rolled out again to all VMs that are in that HR sort of silo. The, the overall point here is there's lots of administration and stuff that needs to be done by IT to keep the lights on and updated in this type of deployment. What we're trying to do is move over to the right hand side, which is where we do have one single image. We're bringing in the user profile from FS Logix, and then we are bringing in every type of application. So the departmental as well as the common apps from Appatach. And we're dynamically delivering those apps to any VM that the user might log on to when the user needs it. So no longer do we have to have separate images with separate applications on for separate collections of users. We have one image used throughout the organization and the users just consume the apps when they need them. So a far simpler, more efficient, and in, in hope, hopefully it should be far cheaper solution than the, the one on the left, which is you know applying or requires far more management overall for IT. So let's just have a look at <clears throat> how this works. Now, this is just a video of the experience. Now, this, to, sh to stress, this is absolutely not the user experience. Th this is just the mechanics behind the scenes, just to demonstrate what, uh, what actually happens. And, and again, this is all managed by the WBD control plane. So in this instance, I'm, I'm running PowerShell to initiate it. That is absolutely not a requirement. <clears throat> the WBD control plane will orchestrate all of that. <clears throat> now, what you'll see on the left is add remove programs. What you'll notice is Power BI is not installed on this VM. In the middle is Disk Manager, and on the right hand side, like I said, is, is um, PowerShell, which I go and initiate the attaching. I'm just going to play this video. So, on this VM, I'm just going to go and try to launch Power BI, and you'll see that it's not present, so I can't launch it. I come to PowerShell and run the basically an attachment script. What that does is it attaches that disk that you see in Disk Manager. I come and search for Power BI, and now Power BI is, or at least there's an icon for it. And what you will now see is Power BI is launching on a VM where Power BI is not installed. And that is the app attach capability. Now, Power BI is registered with the OS. It knows it, it's outdated and needs an update. <clears throat> and the actual application behaves <clears throat> like you would expect Power BI to behave. So you know, to a user, they can't determine that this is not installed locally. So the detach process is the same. I run a script to detach the VHD. That now disappears. The app is registered and destaged from the VM. Come to search for Power BI, there's, it's no longer there. So it's, there's no presence or no remnant whatsoever of Power BI having ever been installed, or in fact, not even installed, but presented to this VM. So this is the capability behind the scenes, and it really shows how you can dynamically deliver apps to VMs and thus to users, um, rather than having to spend time installing applications physically onto that VM. So just to come back to the slides then, um, just the final slide just around the mechanics specifically inside of WVD. Now, like I said at the beginning, this is in preview. We'll be here hopefully um, in the next couple of months. Um, but this just demonstrates what goes on in, 
in conjunction, I suppose, with the Azure portal, the WVD control plane, and the session hosts, and for that matter, the, the, the SMB storage where these VHDs reside. So the first action is that IT needs to go and assign MSIX packages to a host pool, and they do that inside of the Azure portal or via PowerShell. When that happens, the WVD control plane will instruct a random session host in that host pool to go and read the VHD that houses the MSIX package where the applications reside. Now, at this point, the session host is interrogating that VHD, checking that there's a certificate that's present in the VHD, um, is checking the consistency, if there's any dependencies and all of that kind of good stuff. Um, if that's all good, then the next step is that the all of the session hosts within a host pool will check in with the WVD control plane to say, are there any MSIX packages that I need to mount for users? Now, it will do that within five minutes. Now, this is a random five minutes, random from the point where the VM starts up. So basically, within a five-minute period, all of those session hosts will have checked in and then mounted the VHD. Now, that can be reduced via registry setting down to one minute for customers that you know want to accelerate this. Um, so they, within five minutes, they'll check in. They will then reach out to the storage location that has that VHD and mount that VHD onto the session host, which then enables users to sign in and then go and um, launch the application in a process called registration. And then they can go off and consume that application. So that's the, the process from a WVD perspective. Let me just show what that looks like inside of the Azure portal. So if I just bring up uh, the Azure portal, this is the WVD part of the um, Azure portal. Um, and I'm going to an aptly named MSIX App Attach host pool. Now, what you'll see here is a new MSIX packages section of the portal. This, this is the part that's enabled through the, um, through the public preview. So all I need to do, in fact, there's two steps. The first is to add the application to a host pool. So if I click on Add here, all that I need to do is to add the VHD location, the SMB um, location that contains my VHD. So this is just an Azure Files location that I've got in my Azure subscription. It's actually connected by a private link, which means I can't or custom nobody can connect to it other than on the VNet that these um, these session hosts reside. And if I tap out of here, what this will do is it'll go and interrogate that VHD and determine what applications are within it. Now, it's just worth noticing here that within this package, I've actually got two individual applications, so Chrome and Edge. I could have one, I could have multiples. This is just demonstrating that I can bring applications together inside of one package and then present them individually to my host pool. So I could click on De um, Edge here. In fact, I've already done that. Um, just give it a name. So this is anything and then say it's active. If I clicked on add, it would add it, as you will see here, to the, the list of um, applications that this host pool has access to. So that's the process for adding the app to the host pool. The users can't at this point access the application. So to do that, I need to go to my application group, which is the connection between apps and users. So <clears throat> I can come to my um, application group, go to applications and click on add. And what you'll see here is the MSIX packages and all of the applications that this host pool has access to, I can choose to present to this particular application group. If I just clicked on save, then that would add it and then present, enable the user to consume it. Now it's worth just noticing um, another point that lots of customers ask is they might have a, a large host pool with lots of applications. How can they restrict certain collections of users from only consuming certain apps? The way to do that is to create multiple remote app groups. So if I just go into here and show you, in this one, I've got Chrome and Edge, so two applications. That's assigned to a number of users. If I go to a different remote app group, so this the second one here, go to applications, you'll see a different set of apps assigned to a different set of users. So what will happen is when, when the users from those groups log into the host pool, they will only see the applications that they've been assigned to via this application group. So um, let's go back to my session host then. Um, so this is a session host that I've connected to just to save some time. What you'll see in Disk Manager is a couple of things. My FS Logics profiles for starters are here, but then also I've got, what is it, four 
discs that have been mounted onto this session host. If I just show you the properties of one of these, if, if I just go and detach this disc three, um, this is actually Visual Studio, uh, if Visual Studio Code, I should say. Um, and what you'll notice here, if you noticed earlier, was this is the same um, Azure Files storage account, which I've placed these on. So that's the disk that's been attached. And as you would imagine, um, if I go and search for Visual Studio Code, uh, you'll see it here. If I launch this, this will go and launch Visual Studio Code. So that's um, that's the, the I suppose the real life launching of uh, an MSIX application in real time there. So that's Appattach. That's our first roadmap item. If I go back to the slides, we can then move on to our second feature, which is called RDP short path. Now, again, this is in public preview. The GA is expected within Q1 of, of 2021. Now, RDP short path is a capability that actually started development way before COVID. And it's really designed for optimizing user connectivity into the WVD session hosts. And it does that by using any managed network that the customer has in place. A managed network is, like we said earlier, express route or a site-to-site -site VPN. Now, <clears throat> to explain what this is, we just need to go back a step to look at the normal connectivity that a user um, follows to get to their session host. So what we've got here is the WVD client. We've got the gateway that's part of the control, uh, the WVD control plane, and then the session host in the Azure subscription. Now, when the session host on the right-hand side boots up, it actually reaches out to our gateway and it establishes a TLS 1.2 uh, encrypted stream. Now, inside of there is just the brokering comms, basically advertising itself, you know, and how to connect to the session host. So that gets established when the session boots up and then basically sits there waiting for a connection. When a client uh, connects, they effectively establish exactly the same thing. So they will establish a TLS 1.2 encrypted stream to our gateway. And inside of there, again, is just the brokering comms. This is who I am and this is potentially the resources that I'm going to launch. And it does that across the public internet. Now, that traffic is encrypted using a certificate that Microsoft manages um, and that's installed on our gateway so that's all established prior to a user actually trying to physically connect to the session host so and that's the next step the, the next thing that happens so a user will actually click on an icon they will then establish a second tls 1.2 encrypted stream inside of the first that goes through our gateway through to the session host so effectively, we've got this inbound connection, which is being brokered by our gateway, and it establishes a connection to that outbound connection from the session host. And at this point, we've got TLS, uh, sorry, we've got RDP traffic inside of two TLS encrypted streams. So it's encrypted twice, so it's very secure. So that, that's how customers connect today across the internet using our gateway. What RDP short path will introduce is this ability to direct that traffic via express route or a VPN. So the first original outside encrypted streams are still established. So we understand who the user is. And we can understand what the session host is. But once that's established and the user then connects and we detect that express route is in place, we will direct that TLS, um, sorry, the RDP connection directly across express route into the session host. The point here is, if a customer has Express Route, there's obviously a cost associated with that. Let's make use of that cost. <clears throat> and also, Express Route should, in theory, be a lower latency connection into the session host. So let's absolutely make use of that to improve the user experience. Uh, the, the other thing is, not only are we sort of bypassing the gateway, we're reducing network hops and we're improving the user experience of that session host we are also introducing the udp protocol here so the previous connection all uses tc all uses tcp we are now using udp which is a far more efficient protocol anyway to connect in so the combination of taking that traffic off of the gateway off of the internet and the introduction of udp should in theory improve the user experience um, and just for those people that like pictures this is the sort of the 
connection architecture what you'll notice is that blue dotted connection is the rdp traffic that today outside of rdp short path goes across the internet with rdp short path we are obviously going direct now let's just have a look because we've got a couple of sessions running i can show you what the um the performance improvement is hopefully so if i go back to my msix uh session and go to my connection details what you'll see here <clears throat> is that we are yes indeed connecting with tcp so if i just zoom in here and we are connecting and we've got a round trip time of 39 milliseconds if i connect to uh, if i just close this if i connect to my rdp session where i've got this enabled my rdp short path session where we have this enabled hopefully the connection will be much better so the first thing we see is that um the transport protocol here is udp and the round trip time is slightly less so 28 milliseconds in this case and we have seen significant improvements now um I wouldn't expect a massive difference from my own environment. So I'm working from home and I've got a point to site VPN, obviously goes across the internet directly into my VNet. So both connections are actually going across the internet. Um, I haven't got express route in place, which is where you would see the sig most significant improvement, but it does demonstrate that there is obviously some performance improvement. So the first one um, of the final two is a capability that we call anti-screen capture protection. Now, this is designed for organizations in particular that work in regulated industries where they have to, by virtue of those, um, those industries, prevent the capture of content that, that's running in a session. So the UK case here is you might have users taking um, a snip of what's running in the session, or they might be running a screen sharing application there's loads of them, Teams, Zoom, whatever it might be, where you might be genuinely sharing your screen with some end, some, some customers or some vendors that you're working with. Um, and you might accidentally be sharing your WVD session where you might have some private information that can't, can't be captured. Now, the, the end consumers of that screen sharing might go and take a, a screenshot themselves, or there is malicious software that's out there which might be running and um, taking that automatically behind the scenes and passing that back to uh, the host in that instance. So what this looks like is, uh, is I suppose, two things. Here with the snipping tool, we've got um, a WVD session which has turned black. Now, depending upon the version of Windows, it will either turn black or it will actually completely and utterly disappear. So if you've run up the snipping tool, your WVD session just disappears. You close the snipping tool, your session comes back again. In this instance, when this was taken, um, we had the black um, screen experience. So the net result of that snip there would be what you see exactly there, which is the browser, the client, and then just this black box. So no content whatsoever can be shared. The same user experience can be had with Teams. So this is a Teams call where someone's sharing their screen and they've got um, the WVD session running. So we are now hiding that WVD session. Now, the, the problem here is it's impossible to demo this <laughs> because we are, as you're aware, recording this using some screen recording software, yeah. which we then pick up and prevent the session from being shown. So I could show you, I could attempt to show you my WVD session where I've got screen capture protection enabled, but you won't see it because <laughs> WVD is natively hiding that. So the demo is not great, but the uh, at least hopefully these pictures can demonstrate what the overall capability is. Yeah, I think that shows how powerful it is, Tom, because you've talked about um, applications that we're all familiar with nowadays, Teams and Zoom being stopped. Um, but we're using something called StreamYard. And then I think you're trying yep. to record your own screen when we weren't in this session and you couldn't do it. Yep. So it obviously picks up a whole host of applications that can capture your screen. So it sounds like it's going to be a powerful feature that our customers are going to enjoy or maybe not enjoy, depending on what their jobs are doing. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so it was a, a stupid moment I had when I tried this and then thought, why is this not working? And then it dawned on me that it's doing exactly what it's designed to do. <laughs> and it was me that was being stupid. Anyway, so yes, it is good. It picks up, so I've never used StreamYard um, and I, it, I was pleasantly surprised that actually we're picking that up. That, that is a screen sharing um, application and we're preventing that access. 
Okay, so the final um, capability is this thing called Start VM on Connect. Currently in private preview, so customers can't sign up for this unless they are a part of the private preview. Um, the public preview is expected to start in uh, February. So this is very much a sneak peek at this capability. Now this does exactly what it says on the tin, which is start the VM when the user connects. Now the use case for this is, obviously besides the obvious of getting the VM um, powered on for the user, <clears throat> we have some existing automation tools, um, firstly inside of WVD natively, but also inside of Azure that can do power management of virtual machines. What that means is that IT can predict when a, a user or a collection of users would need their virtual machine and start the VM sometime before, let's just say 30 minutes before. So for a user that starts at nine in the morning, IT might say, well, let's power it on at eight o'clock, it's, it's ready to go. Now, what happens if the user starts at 10? So there's an hour and a half of cost of a VM being powered on with no one connected to it. If the user's having a half day and starts at one in the afternoon, that's even more time. If they were unwell and weren't working at all, then that's a whole day of expense that could be avoided if we gave the user the power to power on. In like manner, if they started early, let's say they started at seven in the morning, there's an hour and a half of waiting for this VM to be powered on by the automation tools, which is downtime for the user. So they're being unproductive and they will probably create a support ticket into IT to get it powered on. So overall, not a great user experience. So what this does is it provides the end user with the power to power on their VM at the point just in time that they need it. Now, um, there's only a couple of things that are required. This is a host pool, a personal host pool. We just surface some radio buttons to say enable this. So that's on in this in this instance. And the other thing is we need a um, an IAM, a custom IAM role that's assigned to the WVD service that has just the read and start permissions. And then what we do is we um, there's no sort of power on button. Basically, the clients will detect whether the VM is powered off and then go and power it on. Um, actually, the first thing I wanted to show you, just to show that this is not um, any smoke and mirrors, if I go back to the Azure portal, I've got two VMs here that are personal VMs in my host pool that um, are configured for start on, um, on connect. One of them is this one here that's published to myself. So all I need to do is click on the client and this will then go and detect that the VM is powered off. Now, there's a new piece of text that gets displayed inside of the client called starting remote PC. If I come back to the Azure portal and refresh this, you will now see that this VM is starting. Now that will take two or three minutes to start, register in with the control plane. The next thing that happens from a user's perspective is that this client that you see here saying starting will then actually connect to the session and the next thing is I'll be effectively be connected and logged into my personal um, desktop in this use case. So what that's, what that's demonstrated is that that VM can be powered off for as long as possible. So as many hours in the day that that can be powered off is, is now possible. And only when I actually need it will we start that VM. So this what's actually happened behind the scenes is the WVD service has made a REST API call off to Azure Compute with the name of my host, uh, my session host, and then asked to power it on. That's through that um, I am that custom I am role. We've been authenticated, so we know who we are in terms of asking Azure Compute to power that on. And then like we're seeing here, we're connecting and eventually in a couple of minutes, we will actually then go and connect to that. For customers that want to sort of learn more, we do have a, an all up sort of root documentation for WVD, which is in, you see there listed as learn more. The th three of those four items that are on a public preview, customers can go and deploy this and um, get up to speed with the capabilities. There's links to each of those uh, of the three that we mentioned. And then that start on VM um, on connect will be starting preview hopefully in, in February. And then for more information, we have uh, a number of areas. So um, looking back, we have a what's new page. What th This gets updated every month with all of the features that have landed into the WBD service every single month going back. And then for customers that wanna look forward, we do also have a WBD roadmap. 
which is listed there. And then for customers that want to change that roadmap, they want to add new features and capabilities, we do have a WBD user voice where you can go and submit your ideas, submit your feature requests, complaints, whatever it might be, and then engineering do listen to the comments that are placed inside of that user voice, which means that potentially um, th those features could end up on number one, our backlog, and then onto the roadmap, and then into the product. So that was the end of, of my slides. If you did want to reach out to myself, then I can be reached in Twitter and LinkedIn. And I do uh, at those addresses that you see there. And I also have a, a blogging site where I blog about new capabilities and features that are coming to WVD. So yeah, if you, if you want to learn more, have a look at my website. If you want to reach out, then you can contact me at Twitter and LinkedIn. So. That's Thank you so much, Tom. That's all right, no problem. <laughs> um, that was really interesting. Um, what we'll do with the links that you shared on screen, they'll be in the description box. So if you want to check out the links Tom shared, please do check that description box below us. Um, what I want to reiterate to a lot of customers was, was, was something that you talked about, the user voice. That is very critical to how our engineering teams actually kind of manage their, their roadmap features and where they go. So it is massively critical that if, if there's something that you want, if there's something that you don't like, please do head to that user voice. Because um, as Tom said, um, the, the teams do pay attention to it. And that's probably how those four roadmap features that Tom's just talked about have actually come around. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it is worth, double, you know, absolutely stressing that, you know, engineering aren't existing in some ivory towers in, in Redmond. They absolutely do listen to feedback. The the number one uh, mechanism for getting that feedback is that WVD user voice. If you've got something that's really pressing, absolutely stick it in there. It will be read. No guarantees that it will turn into a product. But there's if you if you've got a fantastic use case for this, then absolutely it will happen. Um, the the other thing that's worth stressing is that um, the work that the engineering team does is prioritized, as you would imagine, and it's prioritized on the amount of demand for that capability. So if you if you've got other users or other um, I suppose end user computing people that you uh, associate with who have the same problem, get them to also submit exactly the same feedback user user voice, and that will get it bumped up, hopefully. And then hopefully that will um, become come into that platform. So absolutely make use of that to get your capabilities and feature requests, whatever it might be, into the, the platform. Excellent. Um, thank you again, Tom, for this session. Um, and great. as I <laughs> and as I said, if there's any information that we want to share, the links that Tom mentioned, please do check our description box below for more information.